Number one, people had um, for a long time thought that the deep ocean was static. Uh, it wasn't until the 1950s that they actually were able to put uh, floats into the deep ocean and see that they that there really were these currents and that they were pretty significant. Yeah, this program, um, which we nicknamed Dynamite, came about as a, a recognition that there was uh, a lot of mixing and motion in the very, very deep layers of the ocean. We're talking from 3,000 meters down to 6,000 meters, which is two to three and a half miles deep in the ocean. It takes all different kinds of instruments uh, to get the sort of information that we need. We put six moorings, and each of those moorings was instrumented with two robots that were essentially um, profiling, going up and down every five or six days. And these were taking measurements of pressure, temperature, salinity, and velocity. The purpose of the moored array was to then actually capture how much flow is there at this particular place in the ocean. And these were able to sit in the ocean for two years. And then when they come up, it's either Christmas with presents or it's coal in your stocking if the instruments don't work. The first mooring was located uh, at the top of Bermuda Rise where the, mid, where the ocean depth was at 4,000 meters. And then I had six moorings all the way down to 6,000 meters. In 2012, we went out to recover the moorings. Everything went really, really well, except when we got out to mooring number six. The release typically is on the mooring in this manner, and when you send the release code, it will open up this T-shaft and allow this mechanism to drop the anchor and everything else floats to the surface. So as you go deeper, the pressure builds and pressure builds, so you will have possibly thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds per square inch on these instruments. That pr hydrostatic pressure prevented this T-shaft from moving and allowing the release to operate properly. Anything that we could have done um, from the ship, we tried that day. It was a letdown because we couldn't get it. You know, that six piece was vital. And even at that point, I think Ruth uh, was thinking ahead of how she can get this final piece to her puzzle. The only way that we were gonna be able to get this mooring back was if we sent a robot down to actually cut the line. Only piece of equipment in the world that was capable of going to these depths and had the video equipment, everything was Jason. And as it turns out, uh, the Jason was gonna be on the Nor. They were starting in the Azores and then they were gonna track into a port on the East Coast, either Florida or um, South Carolina. And they were gonna go, go right over the mooring. I got uh, the, uh, an email probably four months before the cruise saying that we were going to add two days to the cruise to go cut this mooring free. And uh, of course the first thing I did was call Scott Worlow and, go and, and ask him for some real good information. What is this thing going to do when I cut it? And you know, he had seen so many of them come to the surface that he's got the best idea of anyone on the planet what that actually does when you cut it. As long as we did our homework very, very well, we were not going to you know, get entangled. So the big, the big problem here was understanding the currents and knowing which way they were going. And the number one thing that you can probably guess on is we need to pinpoint exactly where that mooring is. Um, you have a general idea that when you drop a mooring, you have a lat long where you put it. But when you're going three and a half miles deep, there's a lot of drift and set that can happen with currents and, and anchor as the anchor comes down, it's gonna move a bit. Um, the bottom anchor's only about, oh, a meter in diameter and maybe waist high, no more than that. So it's this tiny little thing in the middle of the ocean, three and a half miles down, and we've got to find it. So we went around and we did about seven or nine different um, triangulation spots to find out exactly where it was that night. And then sent that final information over to the NOR at I think about 11 or 12 at night. I got woken up at about 4 a.m saying that they need roughly, or that Jason would like roughly, a hundred points instead of seven to nine, which makes sense. The more spots, the better for them. So 
we got up and immediately started doing more uh, points. Now the next morning at 4 a.m. we all got up early, prepped the vehicle, and, uh, and got on, on site. So we transferred over in a small rubber boat out in the middle of the ocean, got on, on board the Knorr, we walked into the Jason van. Well, you, you go in there and you immediately say, wow. So these are the Jason control vans. It's very dark in here, and the only light you have is from the monitors. We have somewhere about 50 monitors in here. The pilot who sits right here and uses all these controls in front of him is basically driving the ROV itself and doing most of the, um, the manipulating and, and, and all that stuff from this seat. You know, in my 32 years of going to sea, I've never had an opportunity to use uh, a robot technology like this. And I'll tell you, it was really cool. So they've got the sonar going and we're looking to see if we get any kind of a, a bounce back on it. Finally on the sonar, a little blip came up and popped up and that's when I started feeling pretty good about myself and happy that the triangulation worked. At 6,000 meters deep, they gave us a position that was within 50 meters of accuracy. Um, that's an amazing feat in itself. And so we continue to move very methodically, very slowly, and our first visual indication was this disturbance in the sediments that formed kind of a circle. The whole anchor was buried in the sediments, and there was just this chain sticking up. It was at, probably at the limits of what Jason could handle, and they did it. They That's found it. the mooring. That's it. <laughs> Jason begins to rise along the mooring chain, because we wanted to take a look and, and film with the cameras to see what, what was the status of the mooring. We start to actually go up the anchor chain, and we see the nylon wire, and then the chain, and, and then we take pictures of the acoustic releases and there's a little tag on the high def video that says checked in uh, June of 2010 or something like that. And that was kind of a chuckle there. I've been doing this for a long, long time and I've never seen any of our moorings, what they actually look like down there. The moment came and we said, all right, let's cut this loose. And so they brought Jason down, took its robot arm out it took a few swipes because we used a serrated knife, but I had two backup knives on the vehicle, and just in case hydraulics failed, you know, that one in a thousand chance, I had put a knife attached to the basket so we could fly up and actually hook it and cut it. And we were going to cut this thing. Yep. Ooh, one more. One more. <laughs> wow. The third one, it was just the last little bit left. Fourth one. <laughs> the mooring, which has a lot of buoyancy um, to hold it vertical in the water and to make it rise to the surface, of course, just took off like a shot to the surface. It's like, yes, we did this. And it took us, oh, three, or three hours, I guess, to um, retrieve the mooring successfully. We get it on board, and the instruments had two years of data on them. Yay. It was so cool. It, it's made it so now this experiment is a success. You know, we're going to know what the deep circulation is and why it's happening. It's all part of the global circulation system that in turn is responsible for moving heat around the planet. Um, it's a tremendous team of people working together to make all of this happen. And it's why I love oceanography. You know, I just love working with these people and, and working together as a team like that.